patterns of behavior, failings in sin, roadblocks in your discipleship, feeling such a failure, you know, do I belong? Friend, if that's you, you're in good company because you need to know if your trust is in Jesus Christ, you are one who is sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's the truth. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller, glad you've joined us today. And Jonathan, you just used one of those big churchy words, sanctified, sanctified in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, to be sanctified means to be cleansed of sin and guilt, to be made holy in the sight of God. And it is one of the most wonderful ideas wrapped up in the Christian gospel. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that there will be people listening today, and the number one burden on your heart is that you feel defiled, stained by guilt and by wrongdoing. And if you think of coming into the presence of God, all you can think is, he's going to see my sin, he's going to see my wrongdoing, and it's shameful that you feel. And the wonder of the gospel is that Jesus, through his death on the cross of Calvary, through the shedding of his blood, he makes us clean as we trust in him. And he makes us totally clean, thoroughly clean, permanently clean. It's the most wonderful concept and the most wonderful truth. Well, it is a wonderful truth and one that we're going to look at in today's broadcast. So I hope that you will take your Bible and join us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as we continue a message what the gospel says about flawed Christians. Here is Jonathan. Now, there may be some things in your life at the moment that are quite unsanctified, if you're honest about it. Patterns of behavior, failings in sin, roadblocks in your discipleship. You may be very, very conscious of that as we gather here today. You may have debated actually coming to church this morning. I have no idea. Feeling such a failure, you know, do I belong? Do I belong? Friend, if that's you, you're in good company, and it's good you're here. It's good you're here, because you need to know, as I need to know, as as we need to know all together, if your trust is in Jesus Christ, if you are joined to him by faith, you are one who is sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's the truth. That is the objective gospel reality. Whatever mess there has been, and even remains in your life. If the Corinthians were sanctified in Christ Jesus, if Paul could say that of them, then it is true of us. What a comfort. What a reassurance. What a joy-filled reminder. Those who belong to Jesus, who are sanctified in Christ, are those who are called to be saints, middle of verse 2, who are called by God to be his holy people. That is what it is to be a saint, one made holy by Jesus, one set apart from the world, one called to live then a holy life, a distinctive life. A saint isn't a person in a stained glass window, a special kind of Christian, but rather all Christians are saints of God, made holy through Jesus, and that's us, that's you, that's me, if we belong to the company of people, end of the verse, who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. If we call upon his name for salvation, we are sanctified. We are saints. We are part of the global family of Christians. Still part of the global family, not written off. The flag hasn't been taken down outside this embassy of heaven. The ambassador hasn't been fired. No, still in good standing. Notice the warmth. Notice the sense of inclusion. These Christians, despite all the mess, are called to be saints together with all those who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Part of the family. Paul isn't, he's not writing them off. He's not writing us off. He's not pushing them to the margins. And that's so important to see. So reassuring. You know, the Lord, he isn't in the business of writing off his people. Isn't that wonderful? He isn't in the business of abandoning us when we fail, of letting go of stumbling and sinful disciples. We might feel like we don't belong among the people of God. I was talking this week with someone about imposter syndrome, which is a real thing in professional circles, the sense that you're you're really a fraud and you don't really belong. I think we can often feel like that as Christians, can't we? An imposter syndrome. I don't measure up. I'm a disappointment. I'm the letdown, the weakest link. But you see, that's not how it goes in the church of Jesus Christ, in the family of God. If we belong to Jesus by faith, we're part of the family. If we're in Christ, no matter how we're doing at the moment, we are objectively called to be saints, 
together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and and ours. And because these things are true of the Corinthian Christians and true of us, no matter how we're doing as Christians today, Paul can launch his letter with a word of greeting, a word of grace. This is going to be a hard-hitting letter. Sin is going to be addressed. Paul isn't going to pull any punches, but notice the warmth of the greeting. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to the feeble, the flawed, even the fallen. Grace and peace from the Father and the Son. Flawed Christians, flawed Christians like the Corinthians, flawed Christians like us are sanctified in Christ. Their sin has been cleansed. They're part of the family. They live under grace. They have the unspeakable privilege of peace with God. That was true of them, and praise God, it is true of us. Next. Flawed Christians are supplied with every gift. Verse 4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking any gift. If you see something that's malfunctioning badly, say your car, I don't know, develops a major problem, It won't drive in a straight line or the transmission won't shift properly or the engine, it just won't produce power. You may well wonder to yourself, you know, did something go wrong at the factory? Maybe a component was faulty. Maybe a key piece was was missing. Maybe there was a significant lack or an oversight when it was put together. When we look over Paul's shoulder at the church in Corinth and see all kinds of things there that are off kilter and malfunctioning, as we will, of course, throughout this letter, as we observe division, immorality, pride, all the rest, we might ask if this church was actually established on the right foundation to begin with, if it was put together properly right from the start, if it ever received all the components necessary to be able to function properly. Maybe there was a lack. Maybe there was an omission right from the get-go. But Paul, he puts that idea to rest, doesn't he, right in these opening verses. He He gives thanks And actually, when you think about it, that's quite something. He is thankful for these people who are so problematic, thankful despite all the mess and all the sin. He gives thanks for them because he sees that God's grace has come upon them in Christ. The gospel has come to them, and they have received it. And the testimony about Christ was confirmed among them, verse 6. It was confirmed because they received it, and they gave evidence of salvation. And here is the evidence, verse 7. They received spiritual gifts. So that you are not lacking any gift, says Paul. When you and I come to Christ and are born again of the Spirit of God, one of the things that takes place in our heart and in our life is that God gives us gifts for ministry and service within the church. These gifts may be latent for a time. It may take a process of discernment for us and others to see what those gifts might be. They will take nurture and development to be made most useful. But the gifts are given, and they are part of the package of being a Christian. Paul will talk more about these gifts later in the letter in chapter 12. He talks there about various gifts like teaching and helping and administration and a few others. But different believers are given different gifts to serve in ministry, to build up the body of Christ. And actually, what we're going to see at Corinth is that the use of those gifts had become a problem because it seems that some members had grown proud of their gifts and had become a bit dismissive of the gifts of others. And this actually became a flashpoint of tension and division. So again, it's it's messy on the ground. Everything's tainted by sin. But Paul wants to drive home the point right from the outset that this church is fully equipped with every gift, and he's thankful for that. God has supplied the Corinthian church with all that is needed to do the work of ministry, to do it properly, to do it well. There's no lack. There is no gap. They were enriched with gifts of speech and knowledge, word and wisdom, verse 5. They were gifted to teach and proclaim the gospel, among other things, And Paul is emphatic about their gifting. Notice it again, verse 7. So that you are not lacking any gift. If you take a product back to the store, car back to the dealership, and you complain that it's not working, that it's faulty, that it's failed you in some way, the first question they're going to ask you is this. Were you using it properly? 
Were you following the manufacturer's instructions? Were you using the product as it was intended to be used? Is the problem with the manufacturer or is it actually with you? The church at Corinth certainly looked dysfunctional and deficient, and some might want to question whether the church was properly equipped for healthy community life and for ministry from the get-go. But Paul wants to emphasize here that God gave to this church all that it needed for health and for flourishing. The gifts were there among the people of God. We're going to see that those gifts, they were being misused. They were being used actually to boost personal egos. They were being applied to ministry with pride rather than used in love and humility. They were being misapplied and the maker's intention was being ignored, but the gifts were there. The church had all it needed. God's supply to them of gift was in no way deficient. That is Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth and a message called What the Gospel Says About Flawed Christians. It is part of our series, A Messy Church and a Majestic Gospel. Now, while we're pausing here, I do hope you'll stay with us because we're going to get back to this message from 1 Corinthians in just a little bit. You know, Encounter the Truth is Jonathan's daily radio program or podcast, but there are other ways that you can connect with this ministry. If you've not been to the YouTube channel, I hope you'll check that out on YouTube. Simply look for Encounter the Truth, and I hope you'll like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. That way you'll be updated anytime we post new content on there. At the website, you'll also be able to check out our weekly e-devotional and subscribe to our newsletter, even links there to social media. You're going to find all of that at the website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Jonathan, you are passionate about teaching God's Word and doing so effectively, and you've got an upcoming conference called the Timothy Trust. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, that's right, Steve, and that's why we've taken the opportunity to partner with the Timothy Trust to run the Timothy Trust National Conference this year, which is a conference aimed to equip Bible teachers to faithfully handle and teach the Word of God. Our our theme this year is the Living and Enduring Word. And we're so privileged to welcome a number of outstanding speakers to join me at this conference. We've got uh, Josh Moody of God-Centered Life and the College Church in Wheaton, Illinois. We've got Dr. Herschel York, who's dean of the seminary at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And we've got David Short, who is pastor of St. John's Anglican Church in Vancouver, Canada. And together we're going to be contemplating what it means to preach and proclaim the living and enduring Word of God in an age such as this. And we'd love for listeners to join us, particularly those who are involved in Bible teaching ministry. The conference is going to take place in Ottawa, Canada, and will be on May 27th to 29th. To find out more, have a look on our website, encounterthetruth.org slash equipping. That's EncounterTheTruth.org slash equipping. And join us in Ottawa, May 27 to 29. Well, again, if you want to find out more information about this upcoming conference, you can visit our website, EncounterTheTruth.org slash equipping, or call us at 833-998-7884. That's 1-833-99-TRUTH. Continuing our message, what the gospel says about flawed Christians, here is Jonathan. All our kids at home are going off on school trips at the moment, and the school has sent home some helpful packing lists. Uh, Gemma masterminds the process of getting everything together for that. The preparation is very thorough. None of the kids, they're not going to arrive at their destination and discover that they're missing something they need. It would be a little different if things were down to me. Things would uh, get missed, I'm afraid. The kids would actually be terrified to go on a trip if I had packed for them. Would there actually be a sleeping bag? a pillow, a toothbrush, it's anyone's guess. But no, as it stands, everything will be well in place. The kids are going to arrive, they're going to open their bags and find that everything that's needed is right there in place. Now, it's, it's very nice to live under that kind of care and supervision. The kids in our household have a pretty good arrangement in that respect. And you and I, within the Church of Jesus Christ, we've been well supplied. We've been well prepared We've been well cared for. That's what Paul is saying. The supply list is comprehensive. The provision was flawless. The church of Jesus Christ is fully equipped 
for the work that God has called it to do. Even the most unimpressive, immature, and stumbling local church, even a church like the church at Corinth, it has been given all that it needs to grow and to thrive. God's preparation and His provision has not been deficient, even in them, even for them. It's a reassurance for us knowing all our frailties, all our weaknesses, sometimes feeling overawed by the task which God has called us to, sometimes feeling overwhelmed by the scale of the task He has given us, often feeling very unequal to all of it. Here is what we know. Here is what we cling to. He has provided every gift needed for the work that He has called us to do. Every gift. Among his people, among you and among me, he has provided all the gifts of administration and hospitality and teaching and helps and many more besides. He has provided all the gifts that are needed for the work to be done. Like the Corinthians, we have been enriched through the gospel that we received, and we are not lacking any gift. And as we think about that truth from the word here, a realization dawns upon us. If we have a need in ministry, if we have a gap in ministry, the problem is not that God has not supplied the gift for us. Here is the problem. The problem is that the gifted believer within the fellowship has not yet come forward to serve. And so that makes this a personal challenge for each one of us, doesn't it? Have you made yourself available to serve? Well, you may say, well, I, you know, I, I don't know what my gifts are. Okay, pray about that. Seek counsel from others. Maybe meet with one of our pastors to talk that over. Try serving in an area of interest and of need and see what happens. See if your gifts emerge and become clear to you and to others. But don't let your gift go unused. When God has supplied your gift for the good of the church, for the spread of the gospel, for the health of the ministry... Flawed Christians like the Corinthians, flawed Christians like us, we are sanctified in Christ. We are supplied with every gift, and finally, we are secure to the end. Verse 7, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. There are plenty of situations and circumstances where we might look on at the situation and rate the chances of survival as being very low. A business is struggling, maybe a store downtown, and things look ragged and chaotic. The staff all look downcast. No one seems to be going in anymore, and you walk by and you, you think to yourself, I give it three months. Or in the political sphere, an election is called and a weak minority government is formed and it's also fragile and they struggle to get consensus on anything and no bills get passed and no one believes that they're going to last a year. Or to move to the level of the individual, a, a patient comes into the hospital emergency room on a stretcher wheeled in by the paramedics and the doctor takes one look and thinks to himself, I can't see this patient lasting through the night. The Corinthian church is weak, it is divided, it is compromised. As Paul sheds more light on their situation in the chapters to follow, it looks like a hopeless case. There seems to be so much wrong here. The divisions are so bad, the sin is so grievous, the spiritual immaturity is so marked. You look on and you think, can this church survive? Will it make it through to next month, let alone next year? But Paul has in mind not next week or next month or next year or next decade. Rather, what does he have in mind? He has in mind the return of Jesus Christ, the day when Christ is revealed. He is taking the long view, and as he looks forward to the culmination of all things, Paul's confidence is that the Lord Jesus Christ will himself sustain these deeply flawed believers right to the end. And notice in what state he will sustain them. Did you see it there? Middle of verse 8. He will sustain them guiltless. He will keep them guiltless. Plenty of sin at Corinth. Plenty of objective guilt. But Paul here reinforces the basic truth of the gospel. That those who belong to Christ, though they are guilty of sin, they have at the same time been made guiltless in Christ and will be kept guiltless in him right to the end. They will be kept guiltless so that as they come to stand before the judge of all, the verdict will be declared at the final day, not guilty. 
not guilty because Christ, the guiltless one, has stood in their place and paid their debt and has given to them, has given to us his innocence, his guiltlessness before the Father. And that standing, it's not something that will be lost. It's not something that's going to be snatched away. It is the permanent possession of the true people of God. Paul knows it's messy in Corinth. He knows that. He knows there's sin that's got to be addressed there. He knows that these are deeply flawed disciples, but he knows as well that the Lord is faithful to his gospel promises, faithful to his word, faithful to his people, faithful to keep us to the end. You see, he's called us into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are sharers in Christ, joined to him by the Spirit, and God will not let his people go And he will, under no circumstances, cast out his redeemed. I don't know about you, but I find that very, very reassuring. I find it very, very comforting. I find it reassuring that Paul could say these things of the Corinthians because I know that they were an imperfect church and an imperfect people. And if these things are true of them, then I know that they are true of us. There's lots that prompts us to give thanks to the Father for his kindness to us. But at at the same time, the honest truth is this. We're a very imperfect church, aren't we? We're very flawed disciples. Isn't that true? The Lord is doing so much among us, which is so good, but we know the stumblings. We know the sin. We know our weaknesses. We know our failures individually and corporately. And, you know, some people observing our flaws and our failures might, might look on at us and say, you know, I give them six months. I give them a year. Look at all that's wrong with them. Look at all their weaknesses and their failures. But the Word of God assures us the Lord Jesus Christ will sustain us to the end. God is faithful by whom we were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, And so flawed Christians like the Corinthians, flawed Christians like us, we rejoice in his faithfulness. And by his grace, we walk forward in trust and in service. We walk forward into the work that he's called us to do. We embrace the ministry opportunities he's given us. We thank him for that which is past. We trust him for that which is to come. Flawed Christians, oh yeah, we certainly are. But in the gospel here is what is true of us. We're sanctified in Christ. We're supplied with every gift. We are secure right to the end. With the conclusion of our message, what the gospel says about flawed Christians, that is Jonathan Griffiths. And this message is the first in a series called The Messy Church and a Majestic Gospel. You can listen to each and every broadcast online when you come to EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported ministry. We're able to be on this station because of your generosity. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book that Jonathan has chosen. Jonathan, you you picked out Being There, How to Love Those Who Are Hurting. Why did you pick this book? Well, Steve, we chose this book because we're aware that there will be many listeners to this program who are in a position of trying to support and care for and show love to friends or family or others in their lives who are going through a time of sickness, uh, who are facing disability, who are walking through depression, or who are dealing with grief and loss. And you as a listener, you, you want to know how to be there how to help, how to encourage, how to bring the love of Jesus. And learning how to do that and do that well, and learning how to persevere in that, well, that's no easy thing. And you need encouragement from the Word of God, and you need wisdom from others who have walked this road before you. And we believe that this resource by Dave Furman being there will be just that kind of encouragement for you. We're eager to get it into your hands, and we hope it'll be a real blessing in your life. Well, we'd love to send you this book. Again, it's called Being There, How to Love Those Who Are Hurting is our way of saying thank you for your financial support this month. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or when you call 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's EncounterTheTruth.org or 1-833-998-7884. You can also write us at Encounter the Truth, 2176 Prince of Wales Drive, Ottawa, Ontario, 
K2E0A1 or in the U.S. at Encounter the Truth, 215 North Arlington Heights Road, number 102, Arlington Heights, Illinois, 60004. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.